Uh, thank you everyone for coming today and today we have Anne Doughty and she's going to be talking to us about story or die. Uh, this is how to use UX methods to tell more effective stories and increase team success. Uh, stories are absolutely critical and uh, to, to how we are as people and I'm really interested to, to find out what's going to go, uh, uh, what story Anne is going to tell us today. Uh, so. Uh, with that, and I'm going to hand over to you. Well, uh, welcome, everybody. As James said, my name is Anne Doherty. I know that's not the usual pronunciation for what you all are used to, um, but it's how we say it here in the US. Um, my pronouns are she, her, or ZZ. I am currently a lead content strategist at Northwestern Mutual, which is a insurance and financial services planning company that is based in Milwaukee, Wisconsin in the United States. I live and work in Washington, D.C., where I have spent the entirety of my 20 plus career year, 20 plus year career in digital. Um, thank you for being here today. I know you have a lot of choices for how you spend your time, and I am glad you are here with us. Today, I want to talk with you about storytelling in the context of UX. You are going to walk away from this presentation with a better understanding of why stories matter and how people consume stories. And I'm going to show you how you can use UX tools you're already familiar with to be a better storyteller and be a more effective team. First, I want to tell you a little bit about me. When I am not at work, I am a curler. That probably requires a lot less explanation for y'all than it does for US audiences. Uh, that is me in the orange hat talking with my vice skip during the last bond spiel I played in. As most of you probably know, bond spiel is just a fancy way of saying tournament. I am also a novelist, which I know is deeply shocking to hear from someone who works in content for a living. I have won National Novel Writing Month six times. And I'm really a little bit in love with it because it's a great way for me to get a finished first draft out of my head and onto paper. The works that I've won NaNoWriMo with include a family drama that's set in a dying farming community on Maryland's eastern shore near the end of the Vietnam War. The next three times were with a swords and magic fantasy trilogy. And yes, there is a dragon, but it doesn't show up until the very beginning of book two. The next time was with a space opera, which I am currently pitching to agents, yay for embracing vulnerability and rejection in the new year. And most recently, I wrote a romance novel. I have also gotten back into photography after several decades away. I took this at the National Arboretum here in Washington, DC last spring. I was super excited to catch this little bee girl doing her thing with some early spring flowers. I've been doing content strategy and content design since the last century, which sounds a little bit weird when I say it outside my head like that. My career journey has been a lot less like this, two points between two, two between straight road between two points, and a lot more like this, like Billy coming home from the bus in the family circus and stopping everywhere between the bus stop and home that seemed even vaguely interesting. And because of that roundabout route to where I am today, I've had the privilege to work in a lot of different spaces and tell stories for a lot of organizations with vastly different resources and goals. I've worked for a couple of fancy nonprofits in the environmental sector. I've worked in the public health sector on a couple of different government websites. I've worked in the association world for both some doctors and for some lawyers. I've worked at a couple of agencies, one of which specialized in nonprofit clients all across the US. The other one subcontracted to a startup. There's actually a whole documentary about how govworks.com crashed. I've worked for a couple of small business owners like a resort hotel in Michigan and a vegan nutritionist group in Canada. And most recently, I've worked in insurance and mortgage for a couple of Fortune 100 financial services co companies. Now, the one thing all of those organizations and businesses have in common is that story was vital to them getting their message across and getting their work done. I am fascinated by storytelling and technology and by how people use both those things to shape their world. Stories connect us to the world and to each other. 
we talk about stories with each other and we relate to the characters in stories as if they were people we actually know because in a way we do know them. The thing about stories is that as humans, our neurobiology is literally wired for them. And the great thing for me about technology is that each advance has only added to our ability to share those stories, whether we're sharing them orally, listening to them, listening to them on a radio or a podcast, watching them on TV or in a movie theater, or maybe consuming them on a mobile device while sitting around a campfire. These are all story delivery methods that people use today. No advance in technology has eliminated any of the previous storytelling methods. Next, I wanna tell you a story about your brain. Your senses give you millions of individual pieces of information every second. Some of that information is directly related to your physical person, and some of it's related to your environment. On screen are some graphics with typical inputs you might get every day, like hunger or needing the restroom or trying to figure out what that weird noise is outside. Most of you are probably familiar with Miller's Law. For folks who aren't, Miller's Law comes from a psychological study done in the late 1950s. And what Dr. Miller found is that the average person on the average day can hold on to five pieces of information simultaneously. If things are going really well for someone, their love life is absolutely what they want it to be. They're super happy with where they're living. Their job is rewarding and pays them well. The coffee or the tea has been ready every time they've wanted it. And the dog has been behaving himself. That lucky person can hold on to six, can hold on to seven pieces of information simultaneously. And if things aren't going so well for someone, like they're living through their fourth year of a pandemic, they're back to back on meetings four days out of five and never get a chance to get away from their desk for lunch. And oh, by the way, the dog just threw up on the white rug in their office. That person, who let's be realistic, has been most of us for the past several years, can hold on to three. Beyond that seven plus or minus two things people can remember at any given time, Another takeaway from Miller's study is that context matters for memory capacity, which means Miller's law applies to almost everything we do. Now the subconscious brain has exactly one goal, and that is your survival. Most animals navigate the world using a sort of innate reflex that neurobiologists refer to as zombie systems. These zombie systems excel at deciding if information is helpful or harmful without the individual having to give it any conscious thought. The subconscious brain evaluates a piece of information and makes a snap decision. Are you safe or are you in danger? Now, as humans, our brain developed a way to make sense of the world, to consciously navigate information so that if we have the time, we can decide on our own what to do next. That's something extra that humans got is story. Your brain constantly seeks meaning from those millions of inputs it gets every second. It casts you as the protagonist in an ever evolving story and relates all of those inputs to how they affect you. Your brain constantly adjusts that story it's telling you all the time based on new information you might not be aware you're even taking in. The two basic things we need to understand about telling effective stories are that first, story is about emotion. Functional MRI studies show that when people are engaged in a story, there is activity in brain regions that are important for language and in regions important for creating associations and generating and processing emotions. The second thing we need to understand is that story is about recognizing patterns. Emotions help create associations. All those inputs trigger emotions, and by feeling fear or anger or love, we create an association, a story around that stimulus. That story helps us predict the future so that next time we experience that stimulus, that need for the restroom or feeling hungry or hear that weird noise or something even vaguely like it, we know what to expect 
And more importantly, we know what resources it will take to react to that stimulus. Story is also the way that we make the learned wisdom gathered from the experiences of others stick. So by experiencing how someone learned something, their successes, and more importantly, their failures, we feel empathy. Those same functional MRI studies show that our brains literally synchronize with the main character in a story. We feel what they feel at the same points in the story. Now, because we are wired for story, we also have to consider how others make sense of story in the world to make the stories we tell effective. And we have to understand what a story actually is. So this is a drama in three parts. And because there is written content and visual content that might not be perceivable for someone with vision deficits, I'm gonna go ahead and read and describe the screen for you for accessibility purposes. This is a trilogue, three people are speaking. Me, did you cook your eggs and bacon fat this morning? I saw you had used some. MJ, no, I thought you had used it. Me, no. Jill, did you use this bacon fat? Jill, mm, no. Now our second image is of a white ramekin sitting on a kitchen counter. And in that ramekin is some solidified fat and what looks like a paw print in the fat. And the third image is of an open staircase railing and peering through that railing is a big eyed tabby cat. Now, as you consume this story, you understand that it works on a visceral level, but recognizing a good story isn't enough. To tell good stories, you have to understand why we are motivated by them and what gets people involved. To understand why, we have to break a story down into pieces. Lisa Cron wrote a great book called Wired for Story. And in it, she defines story as how what happens affects someone who is trying to achieve what turns out to be a difficult goal and how that person changes as a result. If we break that down into familiar plot fictional terms, the, the what happens is the plot. It's the events in the story. So for demonstration purposes, we're gonna use the very first Star Wars movie, the one Disney is now insisting we call Star Wars A New Hope. The beginning of Star Wars A New Hope, a ship is being attacked by a much larger ship. There's a laser gun battle. The smaller ship is boarded. A woman in white interacts with some droids and those droids escape in a life support pod. There's are five plot points that happen at the very beginning of Star Wars. Now for the someone, it's really the protagonist, the main character in the story. And with Star Wars, we're not really sure who these people are yet, but we're willing to give the story a chance because it's the beginning. Star Wars would have failed as a story if it hadn't given us characters to hold on to close to the beginning. In fact, it almost did fail. For a huge chunk of the film, we're given the idea that R2-D2 and C-3PO are our protagonists. For a human character, we don't get somebody to latch on to until we finally meet Luke Skywalker about 20 minutes into the film, which by the way, is almost all of the fir first act, which is about a third of the movie. Now for the goal, it's usually the story question, the thing the main character wants. Most people remember at the beginning of Star Wars that Luke wanted to go to Tashi Station and get power converters, but he couldn't because his uncle was mean and made him go buy droids instead. What they forget is that Luke's original goal was to get off his aunt and uncle's farm and go to the academy, whatever that is, we never actually find out because Luke's goal changes, and become a pilot. And the how someone changes is really what the story is about. So if Luke had stayed that naive farm boy, or Han Solo had stayed selfish and arrogant, or Leia had stayed privileged and also arrogant, we wouldn't have cared about them so much at the end. That's part of the reason why Darth Vader's turn at the end of The Empire Strikes Back is so shocking and ultimately such a betrayal. 
because we're invested in him in a very different way. Now you are probably asking yourself at this point, okay, this is great, but how does it apply to a business context? For UX and digital effort purposes, the what happens is literally the what we did on the project, the content inventory and out analysis and audit, the wireframes, the user research, the usability testing, the prototyping, all of those activities are the plot. The protagonist, the someone, is usually users or stakeholders. Now, here's where it gets a little bit sticky when you start to think about the protagonist or the main character in your story. For business purposes, you generally want to focus on those users or stakeholders. But the truth is, anytime you're presenting, your real main character is actually the audience. That's why figuring out what matters to them is so important. The goal generally aligns to the business goal. And the how someone changes is the impact we made, doing the things we did in pursuit of the business goal on behalf of those users or stakeholders. Now, most business storytelling fails because it concentrates too much on the things we did and not enough on the users or stakeholders or the impact we made. Instead, we need to focus on the someone and the change if we wanna be successful. Chuck Wendig is the author of some very gritty urban horror and fantasy. He's also the author of an irregularly published email newsletter that during 2020 kept me sane adjacent. Incredibly funny, very not safe for work, would not recommend reading on your work computer, highly recommend subscribing. Wendig has five rules for stories. He says that all stories are about change. He says that character is everything and that without people, you really have no story. He says that the small story matters more than the big story. So with Star Wars at the end, we care that the Death Star has been destroyed because Han, Luke, Chewie, and Leia care about that outcome. If they had cared about going to get shawarma, we would have cared about going to get shawarma because we were invested in them and what they wanted. Wendig also says that stories have to affect the audience and that they should do it in this order. They should make them feel, make them think, and entertain them. Which means if the stories you are telling are aiming only to entertain, you are trying to clear the lowest possible hurdle you can. And because he is a writer, Wendig says you should write who you are, that your stories are you and you are your stories. For a business context, I translate that to you need to feel your story. So remember those functional MRI studies I mentioned that show our brain synchronized with that of the protagonist? If your audience thinks for a minute you are bored or disengaged from your story, guess what they're going to be? And if you guessed bored or disengaged, you get 100% on that question. Stories come in a lot of shapes, and your story shape may change depending on the type of story it is. There is the often misunderstood and greatly simplified Freytag's Pyramid. Wendig hates Freytag's Pyramid, primarily because it is greatly simplified. Kurt Vonnegut gave a famous lecture that's available on YouTube where he identified six different story shapes based on the type of story. Probably the most famous story shape is the monomyth. The first Star Wars movie is a series of monomyths for each character inside a larger monomyth. I know this looks super complicated. Campbell's original model has 17 different points a storyteller needs to consider. For business purposes, you can get away with just five major points. First is the call to adventure. So why is this work happening or why did it happen? Next is the road of trials. What obstacles do you expect to face or did you face on your road to a solution? And most importantly, how did you fail? There's the transformation. How did what you learn as you did the work change your perspective? There's that apotheosis, that death and rebirth. 
So how are you consolidating those lessons that you learned into a new experience? And then finally, there's the return. What is the new status? What does the world look like now that the first part of your work is done? Lisa Cron rejects the idea of plot structure, instead preferring to highlight the transformation your protagonist, and by extension, your audience, goes through as they struggle with transformation. She says that every character walks onto the stage with a misbelief, a lie, that informs their behavior and keeps them from hearing your call to action. Your story must expose that lie, not simply by telling them that it's wrong, but by exposing them to the truth. And that truth is the point that you want to make by telling your story. The events of the story and how your protagonist feels about them expose that misbelief for what it is, something that keeps them from getting what they really want and from being their truest self. The next stage is realization. So the events of the story make the protagonist, who is really a stand-in for the audience, on their own question their misbelief. It is this realization that leads to the last stage. Transformation happens the moment the audience realizes their misbelief has kept them from what will actually help them achieve their goals. This transformation allows them to address the external problem related to your call to action. To be successful and to improve your chances of engaging your audience on an emotional level, you have to include three elements in your story. You've got to include surprise. Your protagonist, and by extension your audience, expects one thing to happen and something else happens instead. They're left with the question, what do I do now? The biological reaction you're looking to provoke here is dopamine. Dopamine is the curiosity neurotransmitter. You've aroused their interest. This isn't a situation they've encountered before, and they want to know what happens next. This is the point at which they begin to engage emotionally and intellectually. The next thing you have to include is conflict. Your protagonist has no choice but to make a hard choice. There will be consequences, and they might be bad. The biological reaction you're looking for here is cortisol. Cortisol is the stress hormone. It puts us on alert, ready to commit or possibly flee. You counter that impulse to flee by including the last element, vulnerability. We need to make our audience empathize with the protagonist. We want them to root for our main character, and by now, by extension, the goal the main character is committed to. The biological reaction you're looking for here is oxytocin. Oxytocin is the bonding chemical. It surges when we feel that empathy for the protagonist. Now that you know a little bit about what stories are and why they are so important to humans, I'm gonna show you a way to apply the UX tools you already know and use to creating more effective stories. It's called the POP method. Whether they know it or not, your audience, and that includes all of you listening to this presentation, walks into every presentation with one question in mind. What's in it for me? By spending their time, they are expecting to get something useful out of your presentation. The subconscious challenge to you as a storyteller is simple. You have to make them care. You have to make them care about the action you want them to take or the results you're presenting. And to do that, you have to know who they are. This is where you're gonna leverage your user research skills. You're gonna create an audience persona. You need to know who you're presenting to. There are four things you need to consider at base when creating this persona for your audience. You need to include background. So we have to scale our information based on what our audience already knows. So if I, as a content strategist, am presenting to a vice president of design, I might not need to go into as much depth with the definition of what is content strategy 
as if I'm presenting to someone from human resources, for example. You also have to think about your audience's goals. So your goal is important, but it's only important to you. Think about what your audience is trying to get out of the encounter. Focus on that and how you can frame the story you tell to support their goal while supporting your own. No one ever changed someone's mind with facts. You need to make them engage emotionally and get to a place where the change you want them to make is a change they are choosing because they can see how it benefits them. You also have to think about your audience's needs. Do they want flourishes and fancy graphics? Or do they just want data and text? Figure out what they need to be engaged and give that to them. And the last element for the persona is frustrations. Frustrations are related to needs and may actually indicate them. So does the audience want an overview or do they want to dive into details? You need to be aware of what will make them disengage and avoid that at all costs. The next thing you're going to do is you're going to storyboard or wireframe it out. So as you plan your story, you're going to include all those user requirements and constraints, that background, those goals, those needs, those frustrations. You're also going to have to think about time as you're planning. Scale your story both to the amount of time you have, and trust me, you always have less time than you want, and to the time of day. Short, snappy sections work really well around sensitive times of day, like early morning, or right before lunch, or right after lunch, or close to quitting time. Think about theme. So what is the context in which you'll be telling your story? Is there a theme that's part of a larger whole you can hook onto, or do you have to develop a theme of your own? And lastly, pay any attention to special requests. So has your audience give you an, given you any special requests, like including metrics, or focusing on a particular product, or on a particular team, or on a particular audience? If so, make sure you include that. And the reason to pay attention to special requests, even if they might not align with your goals, is because your audience has expended the energy and vulnerability to ask you for something, which means it's important to them. The wireframe stage or the storyboard stage is also where you consider what your story shape is. Lastly, you're gonna think about your story as a journey. You have to anticipate your audience's needs to be effective. And this is where the POP method comes in. What information do you have that the audience needs? This is the primary question that your presentation must answer. What building block questions must be answered to deliver your message? These are the other questions you have to answer to be effective. You also have to determine what's essential to answering the primary question. You need to prioritize and narrow the scope of your story to sharpen your message and be ruthless when you do this. Things that you love, your darlings that as fiction writers like me say, may not matter to your audience at all. And if you take only one thing away from this talk, please take this pro tip, spoil the ending. Any presentation you give in front of a group or any story you tell in a business context is not the latest movie or the latest streaming video hotness or the latest autobiography. Tell your audience what they're gonna get up front in much the same way I did with y'all while you were looking at the cover slide. They will appreciate knowing where you're going. Members of a team I worked on previously applied the POP method to a presentation they had to give for our group's quarterly meeting. Now, in person, this meeting was long. Pre-pandemic, this was the kind of meeting where the company I worked for would fly people into our headquarters city from regional offices, and it would be two days with a really long morning presentation and a really long afternoon presentation sandwiched around a really awkward catered team lunch. It was awful. Once we moved into virtual meetings, it was still an all-day affair, even during these trying times. So the team that I worked with used the POP method to narrow their scope, and they took their framing device from the kids' book, If You Give a Mouse a Cookie. Now, if you don't know this book, the premise is in the title. 
if you give a mouse a cookie, he's going to want other things like a glass of milk or then a straw for his glass or a napkin for the crumbs and on and on and on. This team used their framework to talk about how they collaborated remotely with one of our business units and what came out of that collaboration. They applied the POP method to create a seven slide presentation that accounted for the audience's goal, which was to be inspired, their needs to be engaged or delighted, and potential challenges with their story framework, like maybe everyone wasn't familiar with the book if you give a mouse a cookie, and with their frustrations. Too much detail was enough to send this audience into their phones even during an in-person meeting. So imagine what it would do in an environment where people were at home and could turn their cameras off and do whatever with impunity. They also considered the context in which they would be telling their story. They knew they only had 10 minutes and that their slot would be near the end of a very long day. They considered the theme of the meeting, which was to show how design could still work even in a world where we couldn't be physically present with our partners. And they considered special requests from our vice president, which was to include metrics and to show how this work aligned with our design group's strategic goals. They used POP to zero in on the question, why does this work matter to our company? They familiarized us with their storytelling framework up front, they spoiled the ending, and they prioritized ruthlessly. Their first draft was 15 slides long for a 10 minute presentation which in my opinion is about five slides too many. Their presentation got the most emoji reactions during the event and was the most mentioned presentation in the post-event survey the next day. So their story stuck. To sum up, the keys to better storytelling, remember your audience's persona and what they want, structure your stories in advance, take them on a journey using POP, and spoil the ending to get your audience engaged. This is everything I have for you today. Thank you so much for being here. The next slide is gonna be some references for this presentation. If you wanna go ahead and take a minute to screenshot it, that's great. If you don't wanna do that, I'm also gonna post the links in the chat after I quit sharing and can see all of your wonderful faces. Uh, normally at this stage, I would tell you guys what is going to happen in next month's presentation, but there is a little bit more exciting news uh, at this point, which is uh, this is my last ISTC meet, um, and we have a new team of volunteers from uh, members of the ISTC who are taking over the events and they're going to be uh, sorting out the schedule and what have you, and they're currently uh, working out who is going to be presenting in February. So if you are not subscribed yet on Eventbrite, please do and go and follow the ISTC on Eventbrite, that way you will know immediately uh, when and we have um, uh, the, the the new events sorted out and 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 the new team are up and running and, and have uh, the information to share for you guys. And the easiest way to find all these links for everything with ISTC meets is on the ISTC website, the URL I gave earlier, istc.org.uk slash events. If you head there and go into ISTC meets, you'll see the link to the Eventbrite page to follow us and all of the previous videos and talks. Uh, so uh, do please keep an eye out for that. Um, we also have a mailing list if you want to email us uh, at istc at istc.org.uk uh, to make sure you get emailed about future events for that as well.